Let's open up to the book of Romans. You'll see the title, Why is our world in this mess? And I would say it's in a mess, wouldn't you? In Romans 7 and 8, Paul talks about this struggle that he goes through on a regular basis. He talks about wanting to do the right thing, but finding himself most of the time doing the wrong thing. He talks about this inward struggle, this dichotomy, if you will, of our soul to where we have this human nature that left to its own kind of has a tendency to seek, sink to its lowest state. But he was talking about he knows better, he knows what's right. Now that we have the Word of God, and he had the Word of God, he knew what needed to be done but sometimes he lacked the power to be able to do it. You might have felt that struggle yourself. I think if you haven't felt that struggle, there's only two reasons for not feeling that struggle. Number one, you're living in the world and don't really care <laughs> about what, any spiritual issues. Or number two, you're dead. But if you're alive, you feel that struggle. And I think that even if you've not given your life to Jesus Christ, you're faith, faced with things all the time. If I make this decision, I can get another $500 back. If I make this decision, I can take this and nobody will know. If I make this decision, it's going to profit me. If I make this decision, it's not going to profit me. And then you have that decision all the time. Even on the freeway, right? Somebody cuts you off. You've got a decision to make, right? You, you either kind of chill and, and uh, say, hey, you know, I'll, I'm still going to get there. It's still going to be okay. Or you take other actions. And when it's all said and done, you kind of look at those and you go, probably not the best decision. So we're faced with those on a constant basis. Well, what happens if we still struggle with those on an individual basis? What happens when the entire nation struggles against it? What happens when your civic leaders begin to make bad decisions? when they begin to give over to the dark side, if you will, and they start making decisions that profit them but maybe hurt everyone else. And how about if it goes all the way up? Well, I was thinking too this morning, we've got a letter here that's written to us by the Apostle Paul describing what's going on. And he's telling us, he's going to tell the people in Rome, he's going to tell them about this struggle. And he's going to tell them why it exists and why they're in the condition that they're in. Now, this is his letter penned by his hand or by a scribe as he dictates to him. And I was thinking, you know, even today, if you got a letter from the president, it probably wouldn't be from him. It would be from one of his staffers. It would be from somebody who knew how to write a good letter. And they would write the letter, and then they would turn around, they'd give it to him, he'd put his name on the bottom. Cool, but not as cool as getting one from Paul that you know he's there, you know that he's concerned, you know that he's writing this. So as he begins to write to the church in Rome, we get to see a great deal of his heart, we get to see a great deal of what's going on in Rome. Now, this was written somewhere around 58 AD. Demetrius, one of the old Greek uh, literary critics, he once wrote this, and I quote, everyone reveals his own soul in his letters. Everyone reveals his own soul in his letters. All you've got to do is go on Facebook to see that is true. Now, you might say, well, but yeah, everybody fakes it on, on Facebook. But if you watch them long enough, their true character begins to come out. If they're excited about something, that's what they're going to write about. If they're mad at somebody, unfortunately, they have a tendency to take it out on them. It all gets exposed eventually if you watch long enough. And this is certainly the case with the Apostle Paul. You get to see his soul. You get to see what's going on. You get to see what's important to him. Now, although the Apostle Paul made a tremendous impact on the church in Rome, it is commonly accepted that neither he nor Peter started the church in Rome. Now, this is significant. It's extremely significant depending upon how you were raised and what church you were raised in. 
they were both martyred for their faith there in Rome. And it is possible that one of the converts on the day of Pentecost went back to Rome and began evangelizing. And that's what's supposed to happen, right? We get saved, we get excited, we start telling people about Jesus Christ, we go back home, we tell our family. So it's very possible that one of them, we don't know for sure who exactly started the church in, the, in Rome, but it already existed. It could have been somebody that they led to the Lord or it could have been even farther down the chain. Now remember also that Paul was chained to the Roman guards for long periods of time. And so therefore they might have come to know Jesus, they might have turned around and given their life to the Lord and somebody got excited and they started the church in Rome. But we got to know, and it's important that we know and understand, the church all already has started, it already exists. It is extremely important to us to know that neither Peter nor Paul started the church in Rome. This is especially significant if you were raised in the Catholic church or you were raised in the Roman church because it is often taught that Peter was essentially the first pope. So it's a, I don't mean to offend anyone with that, but it's important to know the church was already going by someone else. The church is comprised mostly of Gentiles, mostly of guys like us. That just means people that were not Jewish. What's on his mind? When you sit down to write a letter, isn't there usually a purpose to that? Don't you usually have something in mind that you want to say when you sit down and write that? By the way, it's a good idea instead of rambling, <laughs> it's a good idea to have an idea before you sit down and write a letter or you post anything. So what was going on in his mind? What caused him to write it in the first place? Well, he wanted to visit Rome. He really wanted to go to Rome. And he wrote this letter while he was in Corinth with the intent of heading down to Jerusalem to deliver the money, right? Remember that? They made a collection. He was going to head down to Jerusalem. And he wanted to go on to Rome, but he never made it to Rome. Those plans were interrupted when he was arrested in Jerusalem. He finally made it to Rome, but as we saw in the book of Acts and as Pastor Dan closed that up, he made it there as a, as a prisoner, Remember when he was uh, in, that, in that ship headed, uh, it, was, it was full of uh, criminals. And he was one of those criminals when it got shipwrecked on the Isle of Malta. So as we begin to uh, study here in, in Romans, remember that Paul uh, was under house arrest in Rome. As we finish the book of Acts, he was in the uh, house arrest. But at the beginning of this study, he's yet to be arrested. So let's pray and we'll begin. Father, thank you for, I, I thank you for the history. Most of us don't consider ourselves to be writers. But if we stop and think, who's going to know anything about our lives if we don't write it down? Where would we be today if no one had taken the opportunity to write these books of history? to let us know what was happening at that given time. And I know that some decide to write something down so their grandchildren or great-grandchildren or great-great-great-grandchildren or have a little bit of an idea of who great-great-great-grandpa or grandma was. But Paul has written this down. You've given us your word through the apostles. And I pray, Father, that as we read and and uh, you give us knowledge and understanding that we would grow in that knowledge and understanding. That we would understand the significance of the book of Romans. And Father, if it applies to us, I pray that you would allow us to let the guard down, not be defensive, but if you're speaking to us, Father, that we would welcome that, knowing that you mean it, that you have good intentions for us. So we give this all to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. You might want to underline bondservant, called, and separated. And we're going to spend a little time on that. Not much, but a little bit. So he says that he's called and separated to the gospel of God. Verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the scriptures, in the holy scriptures. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh 
and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Remember that phrase got him in trouble more than once. Verse 5. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. Here is the letter and to whom the letter is written, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's letters, and you guys have heard this, I know that you have many times from me, Pastor Dan, and from other teachers. Paul's letters were known for their, their, their beautiful introductions. So we're going to take a, a little bit of a look at that. The first thing I want to point out, he in, introduces himself as a bond servant, as a bond slave. What does that mean? What's the significance of that? Well, in that particular time, and for many years later, slavery was unfortunately there. It was a, a part of life. When you and I come to know Jesus Christ, we become his servant. But we do that willingly. We don't do it out of constraint. We don't do it because somebody pays a certain amount of money. We do that because Jesus Christ gave his life for us. We give our life to him and we become a servant of Jesus Christ. Now Paul is saying, I'm a bond servant. You guys have heard the story many times that the bond servant after seven years he would be set free. And if he wanted to stay with the master, one of the practices would be that they would put his earlobe up against a, a post, and they would put an awl through that, and that hole would signify that he was a servant by choice, or a bond servant. In many cases, they had, in some cases, they had halfway decent masters. And in some cases, they actually loved them. They would put their kids through school and give them training and all, all of that in exchange for them helping out with the family. And in that case, that servant might want to stay with the family. So that signified that they were a bond servant, somebody that was there because they loved them and wanted to be there. Now, I'm not in any way condoning slavery. Please understand that. I'm just trying to explain the situation as it was at that point in time. But in essence, we choose Jesus Christ. We look at Jesus Christ and we say, you're far superior, you have great, you know, tremendous knowledge, we want to submit ourselves to you and we do that out of our choice. So he's a bond servant to Jesus Christ and those of us that are Christians, we are bond servants of Jesus Christ also. We do this willingly. Second, he said he was called an apostle, but he was called to be an apostle. One of the most difficult things in life is finding out what you're called to do. If I ask many of you, are you happy? Are you doing what you feel God's called you to do? I bet you 60, 70 percent would say no. I don't know what that is. Trying to, I think that's a little bit what midlife crisis is all about. You know, that's when the guys hit 40, 45 or whatever it is, and buys themselves a race car with a convertible and buys gold chains and unbuttons their shirts. Well, it depends on their belly, how far they unbutton the, unbutton the shirt. Take on a mistress, whatever it might be. They're halfway through their life, and all of a sudden they look at their life and they're going, I haven't done anything. I've worked at this job for X amount of years. I haven't really accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. What am I going to do? So there's that emptiness inside of their heart, and they start trying to look for a way to be able to fill that up. And in most cases, they end up filling it up the wrong way. There is a, a, a tremendous peace in finally knowing what it is that God has called you to do. And first of all, he's called all of us to be his servants. So we all know that. But when you finally figure that out, now Paul's saying, I was called. I didn't pursue being an apostle. I wasn't even looking to be an apostle. I was headed in the other direction. I was persecuting Christians and bringing them in to be judged and saying killed if necessary. So I wasn't looking to be, apostle, to be an apostle, but God called me. You remember that day on the road to Damascus and that whole thing that took place, the sun, a light brighter than the sun that blinded him and all of that that took place. So he's saying, I'm a bondservant. 
that's the first point I want to make. The second point is that he was called to be an apostle. Number three, he was separated. Now, separated means to be set apart. Set apart. If you have a, a group of things here and you reach in and you take one of them and you move it over here, you've set it apart from the rest of the group. Right? We're all born into this world. We have no choice. Mom and dad make that choice. Right? So we're born into this world. We're in this group of a lot of people. Jesus Christ comes along. We begin to hear about Jesus Christ and we begin to hear about salvation. And for some of us, God has taken and set us apart. Now, not without our will. Remember, we willingly said, God, we want to be set apart. When you become a Christian, you are set apart. Right? So that's the thing that we've got to ask ourselves this morning, and that is, am I set apart? Would anybody be able to tell the difference between me and my drunk Uncle Buck? Or whoever else in the family? Or whoever else that's a scoundrel? Would they be able to tell any difference between me and them? Do I make moral decisions? Do I do my best to seek the Lord to make right decisions? Now, this is the same word that is translated as separate, uh, being separate or being separated. It's the same word that's used in Matthew 25, 32. You don't have to turn there, but it's the word that is used for separating the sheep from the goats. Am I a sheep or am I a goat? Only you know that for sure. Are you a sheep? Are you one of Jesus Christ? Have you given your life to the Lord? Are you still just kind of one of the goats? Living your life that way. It's also the same word that's used in 2 Corinthians 6, 17 when it says, therefore come out from among them and be, what's the word? Separate. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Come out from among them. Have I come out from among them? Now, here's, here's what ends up happening a lot of the time, guys. Remember I talked to you about Paul's struggle in Romans 7 and 8, that human thing that goes on where we, we kind of get drawn back into those weaknesses? And, and we, we have a tendency to go back. We have a tendency to just kind of kind of float back into our old habits, float back into our old practices. We begin to pick up things of dealing with life that you just can't find in the Bible. You, you, can't, you can't find them in there. They're not here. But instead of us letting God purge, letting God do the work, letting God do the healing, we start resorting to our old ways of handling our problems and handling our issues. That's the struggle that Paul was talking about in Romans 7 and 8. But am I still separated for the work of God or have I kind of just found myself back in amongst everybody else doing the same thing? The fourth thing I want to point out here, he identified the recipients of the letter to the saints in Rome or to all those who were in Rome but he mentions the saints specifically now there again depending on your training your religious training your Christian training saints can mean something completely different than what they mean in the word of God you might be aware of certain saints and those certain saints had certain statues and you bowed before them or you prayed before them. But the true definition of a saint, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you are a saint. You see, you don't become a saint because you're, you're righteous because scripture says there's none righteous, not one. So you, you can't have someone, you can't take Paul, you can't take Peter, you can't take Mary, you can't take any of these people and make a saint out of them by their own works or because, because of their good works. Because they would be the first to tell you, I mess up. I mess up. And you might say, well, yeah, but they mess up less than I do. But scripture says if you violate one of the scriptures, you're guilty of all of them. So that puts us all in the same classification, right? Because which one of us has not broken one of them this morning? 
right? So that puts us all in the same place. The only thing that qualifies us to be a saint is Jesus. Jesus, when he comes into our life, he makes us right with God, the root word of righteousness. Our righteousness is through Jesus Christ. It's not on our own. And like it was said this morning, we need to be living in that freedom. We need to be living in that joy that is ours in Jesus Christ. He's done the work. And you know what? The closer you and I stick to Jesus Christ, we will never be sinless, but we will sin less. Because the closer we get to Jesus, the more that we love him, the more that we appreciate all that he's done in our life, we find ourselves wanting to do the things that Christ wants us to do. It makes the difference between making a good decision and a lousy decision, making the right decision, and making really bad decisions. So, he's talking to the saints that are in Jerusalem, so he's talking to those who have given their lives to the Lord in uh, Rome, I'm sorry. But he's talking to those who have given to their life um, to Jesus in Rome. And then fifth, the final thing here, he meets them with grace and peace. And again, you guys have heard me say this, but it has been said, you'll never have the peace of God until you understand the grace of God. If you have no peace, it's probably because you don't understand the grace of God. Well, what is the grace of God? Are you ready for this? God loves you. That's the grace of God. If you want to know what that grace, that, uh, that grace and that love looks like, you look at the cross. You see Jesus there. He's there for you. He's there for me. And he's there for you and I so we don't have to jump through the hoops. All we've got to do is love him. Man, that's a beautiful thing. All right, let's look at verses 8 through 15. He says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. He must have been from the south that your faith is spoken throughout the entire world, the whole world. Verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Wow. I know that any time I have anyone that tells me that they're praying for Becky and I, it means a great deal to me. Verse 10, Making request, if by some means, now at the last that I might find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Do you know what that is? You know what you call that? Fellowship. You call that fellowship. Paul's saying, I really want to come to Rome because I'd love to just sit down and have fellowship with you guys. And you guys know how sweet fellowship can be. Hanging out with other Christians around the Word of God and no, nobody's got the evil eye going on. <laughs> there's a peace, there's a calm, and there's just that fellowship. And that's what he's saying is I'd love to be able to just sit down and hang out with you guys so that I might be able to share something with you that would be a blessing and you could share with me that it might be a blessing. Verse 13, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was hindered until now. That I might have some fruit among you also just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. These young Christians already had a pretty healthy testimony. Paul had already heard about how well they were doing. And Paul prayed for them on a regular basis. And he desired that fellowship with them, but he also said, I've tried to get to you, and I just haven't been able to get to you. Now, look at verses 16 and 17. We see the theme of this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for who? Who? I thought it was just the Calvinists. But that's not what this says, does it? is the power of God for, to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith and is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know, it would have been an easy thing for Paul to say, 
I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I mean, that's easy to say, right? You can say anything. But if your life doesn't line up, it doesn't mean anything. Paul could have said anything he wanted to, and it could have just been, oh, yeah, sure, that's... But his whole testimony lines up. His whole life lines up. His death lined up. Everything about Paul lines up with what he said. So the testimony and his convictions were 100% an absolute truth. Now I've got to ask myself, are mine? If I say that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, does my life reflect that? Now, I'm not saying you got to be out every Friday and Saturday at a park somewhere witnessing. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when it comes down to making those decisions that one's right and one's wrong, no matter how you spin it, no matter how you justify it, no matter how you finagle to make a little bit of it seem true so that we can go ahead and pick it that way, right's usually right and wrong is usually wrong. So does my life reflect that? Am I still in that mode of saying, God, I want to make the right decision. I want to make the best decision, even if it costs me a little bit. I've found that often making the right decision is costly. But the reward is amazing because now you're on the side of righteousness. You're on the side where God can bless you. Making the other decision, you almost, we become an enemy of God. He can't bless that. He can't bless sin. So now we are destined to live our life in misery like we have for the last 20 or 30 years, and it's never going to change because we continue to make the bad decisions. At some point in time, we have to break that and say, I'm going to do what God wants me to do, no matter what, because that puts us on the side of the gospel. It puts us on the side of God. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it's for by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. What makes us a believer? What makes us a believer is our faith in God. But not just a God, not just a God, guys, this God. There are many people who say they love God, but what God? Satan claimed to be a God. People worship Buddha as a God. Which God? Many people say that I believe in God. But I think in America, and maybe in many other places, the number one God that is worshipped is self. I want this, therefore I'm going to do it. I can make a good decision, so I'm going to make this decision. And then we continue to make, again, bad decision after bad decision. But becoming a believer or being a believer is a faith in God, believing that God has told us the truth and that this is truth and we place absolutely everything in the work of Jesus Christ and the cross. When he went to the cross, he went to the cross for me. He went to the cross for you. He shed his blood to atone for all of my sins and therefore I am right before God now. I'm not holy, but I am right before God. I can stand in his righteousness because he went to the cross. So therefore, I can live my life by faith, not by hoops. Not by jumping through the hoops. Not by pretending to be a Christian or only being a Christian when I'm around Christians, but I can live my life in purity and honesty because I just love the Lord. You can tell when a man loves his wife or a wife loves her husband. You can tell it. You can see it. It's not pretentious. It's not fake. It's there. It's real. It's tangible. It's the same with faith. You can tell if it's real because of the closeness of the relationship between Jesus and the believer. Okay. Now Paul's going to tell the church in Rome what mankind has been like. Look at verses 18 through 23. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth 
in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse because although they knew God although they knew God they did not glorify him as God nor were they thankful but they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened futile in their thoughts who has too many thoughts <laughs> I don't know about you guys but getting stuck in your head is a bad place to be too many thoughts too much stuff going on there and if you're not careful you get stuck in there and instead of being stuck in here which is light you get stuck in here which is dark instead of being able to make the good decisions you get back in here and you make lousy decisions and it says here professing themselves to be wise they became as fools isn't it amazing to think we know more than God but we testify to that over and over again by making decisions without it and speaking of the history of Israel here he says and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four footed animals and creepy things the pagan worship that was going on all the time but in this verse he's basically saying God's invisible attributes are in his creation so men is with, they're without excuse sometimes people will say well how about this tribe or this person if they haven't heard the gospel of Jesus Christ well that's a big if first of all God's going to make sure everybody has a chance to hear the gospel before he, before he returns but in this he's saying there's enough evidence in the creation to go out and look at the stars to see the planets there's enough evidence in the creation to prove to people that they didn't do it themselves and it didn't just pop it didn't just slime it's a created thing there's evidence that there is a God that he exists but he says their hearts are darkened by sin have you ever noticed that that's what sin does sin kills it also blinds when we get involved in intentional sin now I'm putting intentional in there because we're all sinners we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God so we're all sinners but when Jesus Christ comes into our life he forgives us of that sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness but there is this repetitive sin this sin that we know that God's telling us don't do that and we do it anyway don't go that way we do it anyway don't make that call we do it anyway that conviction of God's Holy Spirit when you and I make that decision things start getting foggy don't they it's like a thin layer of film kind of goes over our conscience and the next time it's a little easier and the next time it's a little easier another layer of film another layer of film another layer of film till pretty soon it's so darkened we just automatically our knee jerk reaction is to make a lousy decision because we've done it for so long and we think we're so smart but we're told here in scripture that it's foolish look at verse 24 therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness or uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves sexual perversion there 25 who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and they worshiped and served the, crea the, the creature rather than the, than the creator who is blessed forever amen for this reason God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature meaning bestiality 
27, likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men, homosexuality, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Interesting phraseology. 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they, he, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Interesting, he tosses that in. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Wow, that's quite a list. So... Is it any wonder that our world's in the shape it's in? Where does the morality come from if it doesn't come from the Bible? Where does the standard of morality come from if it doesn't come from God's Word? It comes from the little God within us. This is right for me. This is good for me. Don't judge me, man. You have no right to judge me. Well, no, but God does. So... That's quite a list that we're given here. And it says, in verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. You see, when we begin to do these kind of things, we're no longer comfortable around the Bible. We're no no longer comfortable around Christians. And we're no longer comfortable being in church. So we begin to find people that are acting the same way we're acting, doing the same things that we're doing so that we can feel better about whatever it is that we're doing. And did you notice that the Scripture says that God turned them over to a debased mind? You know what that means? If you and I continue to fight God, if we just continue to fight him when we know that he's telling us one thing, there is a time when God will, he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. But I do believe that he just kind of goes, okay, if that's the path you want to take, go ahead. Does that mean he doesn't love us? Absolutely not. Does that mean he'll give up on us? Absolutely not. But there are some times, I know in even raising my own family, there are times when you've said it, and you've said it, and you can't say it anymore. You you just, it's no longer effective. And it becomes evident that, you know, as a parent, you're not going to be the scalpel in the life of that child. You're not going to be the one that's able to speak truth into their life and you just have to back off and pray that God will put somebody else in their life to speak truth to them. And I believe that there are times when, well, we have it right here where God says, uh, if that's the path you want to go down, I don't want you to go down it. I've shown you another path. You know that the path is right, but you want to go down this path, so I'm going to have to let you go down this path so that you can find out what it is so that you can see what it is, so you can see the hurt, so you can see the destruction, so you have a reference point for being miserable. Then you'll know what real joy is. So is it any wonder that our world is in the shape that it's in? Now I'm going to take a couple minutes. I want to read something to you from Ray Stedman. He, uh, this is his uh, commentary on the, on the book of Romans. And I want to read something to you quickly and then we'll close. The most famous mutiny mutiny in history was the rebellion aboard the HMS Bounty in April of 1789. The incident inspired five motion pictures and numerous books. Three weeks after the Bounty left Tahiti with a cargo of uh, breadfruit trees, which was a cheap source of uh, food for the Caribbean slaves, the crew mutinied. First mate Fletcher Christian the leader of the mutineers forced uh, Captain William Bly and 18 loyal soldiers into a small open boat and set them adrift. The mutineers took the bounty back to Tahiti. Sixteen crewmen chose to stay there. 
But Fletcher Christian and eight other men took some Tahitian islanders with them and they set out for a safe hiding place and they chose a lonely uninhabited island called Pitcairn. One of the sailors made whiskey from the native plants and the resulting drunken orgies quickly turned into violent brawls. Though the island looked like a paradise, the mutineers began to view it as a prison. One by one, the mutinous crewmen were either killed in fights or murdered in their sleep. Even Fletcher Christian died violently. Finally, only one of the mutineers was left alive, a sailor named Alexander Smith. As the last man living, he felt responsible to look after the women and the fatherless children who remained. Smith regretted the sinfulness of his past, and he knew he lacked the wisdom to care for the women and the children. He needed guidance from beyond himself. One day he was looking through a sea chest, and Smith found a Bible. Over the next few weeks, he read it from cover to cover. Then he asked God to take control of his life. He also taught the women and the children to read the Bible. Fathered by various mutineers, those children grew up, married, and had children of their own. In 1808, the American whaling ship Topaz stopped at Pitcairn. The Americans were the first visitors to the island since the mutiny of the bounty 18 years earlier. The sailors from the Topaz were astounded to find an orderly Christian society in which there was no crime, no disease, no alcoholism, and no illiteracy. Pitcairn had been called, hair on earth, excuse me, called uh, hell on earth under the siege of Fletcher Christian and his fellow mutineers. The people had suffered under something known as the wrath of God. The inevitable result of human hearts filled with murder, envy, lust, rage, rebellion, and drunkenness. But when the last man on Pitcairn turned his heart over to God, the wrath of God was replaced by the love of God. And Pitcairn became a paradise on earth. The transformation of that tiny island is just a glimpse of what could happen in our own society if we would choose to re, uh, receive the love and mercy of God. We would escape the wrath of God now being revealed against the ungodliness and the wickedness of our age.